In this lecture, we will talk about the central limit theorem. The central limit theorem is one of the most important theorems in statistical inference, and a proper understanding of it is a requisite to understand the advanced topics of the statistical inference. What is it about? Let's see. So this central limit theorem can be split into three, three basically clauses or three parts. That's what I normally do. Different authors have, uh, have different way to basically write the central limit theorem. It makes, my, to my, in my experience, it makes easier for the students to understand it. The first statement or clause or whatever you like to name it states this thing that no matter what the population frequency distribution is, whether it is exponential, whether it is uniform, whatever it is. So no matter what the population standard uh, frequency distribution is, we are not concerned with it. We don't need to know about it. The sampling distribution taken from the population will always follow a normal distribution if all the possible samples of the population of a particular sample size have been taken out, right? Do we understand this thing? I repeat it again, no matter what the frequency distribution of the population is, if we take all the possible samples from the, from the population, the requirement is that all those samples should have the same sample size. All the samples have been taken out, then the sampling distribution of the samples would follow a normal distribution, a bell-shaped curve, right? That sampling distribution definitely would be representing any statistical parameter. And in these cases that we are studying, we are only considering the sampling distribution of the means. Now, the second clause or the second understanding point of the CLT, CLT is an abbreviation for central limit theorem. The expected value of the sampling distribution of mean of this normal distribution that we have obtained will be the population mean. That means since we have got a normal curve and we know that in a normal curve, the central value is the mean value and this would be the expected value of the sampling distribution random variable. So the expected value of the sampling distribution random variable, which will be the middle value, will always indicate the population mean. Now, this is a very powerful statement to make. Because if we have got all the, sam the samples and we have, uh, we have formulated a sampling distribution from all those samples, then the middle value is the population mean. So we, have, we have got a very good estimate in this way. Since every normal distribution or every distribution has a certain measure of dispersion, which we basically call the standard deviation of it, the third statement is about this one. And the third statement to understand the CLT is this, that the standard deviation of this normal distribution, which is what? Which is from the sampling distribution of the means, for example. So the standard deviation of this normal distribution the standard division of this normal distribution will always indicate the standard error. So we basically call the standard deviation of the sampling distribution the standard error. And if the sampling distribution is the, is the means or the sampling distribution is about the means or the sampling distribution of mean that we have got, then the standard division of it will be called as the standard error of mean or SEM. And this SEM for a sampling distribution of mean as a, as a formula, which is the population standard deviation divided by square root of the sample size or sigma upon under root n as it is written over here. We, we don't need the derivation of it. We should only, only need to know that this is the way we represent the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of the mean. So now just to, just to recall the thing so that you may understand, that this basically indicate the standard deviation of sampling distribution of mean. So 
SEM is the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of mean. And this has a formula which is sigma upon under root n. Now, earlier we know this thing that if you have a normally distributed a random variable which does not contain mean values, then the z-score of it is given by x minus population mean upon population standard deviation. Now, in this case of the sampling distribution of the means, we have the random variable which contains all the mean values. Therefore, there would be a little change in the z-score over here. So, since there, there are all the mean values over here, therefore, the sample that we would have taken from it, and if you are finding the z-score for it, then it should be represented with x bar minus population mean upon the standard deviation, which is sigma upon under root n. So, what I am trying to convey to you in a much easier way is this, that you should also always remember that the z-score let me generalize this thing. Um, so I'm adding a slide just to make you understand the things that the z-score is always about two things. In the numerator, in the numerator, we have the random variable value minus the population mean. divided by standard deviation of the distribution. From the distribution. So this is a z-score equation actually. If, for example, that we have earlier studied if our random variable is x, which does not contain actually the mean values, rather they are just measured values, like and so on till let's say we have some nth values over here, then the z-score becomes this one, like x minus mu upon sigma, right? But if our random variable is not just like this as measured values, rather it is rather this indicates the sampling means now this is something which is different from we have been using earlier about the normal distributions so if it is something like x bar then this new random variable will always contain the values of the means like it would be or it can be easily written as x1 bar which means the the mean of the sample which is the first one or the first sub first sample mean then we have x2 bar which is the mean of the second sample and likewise this goes on till we have the mean of the last sample that we have over here this and it is the last sample so this is a new random variable there's a difference between the two i want you to understand that there's a difference between the two this random variable is a sampling distribution mean random variable this is just a normal random variable both are normal in nature since both are normal in nature so therefore both have their z-score values the first one has a z-score given by x minus mean upon sigma or x minus mu upon sigma and the second one is x bar minus mu upon sigma upon under root n because the random variable value is a mean value as can be seen over here then mu is the is basically the population mean and sigma upon under root n is the distribute is the standard deviation of the distribution so that's how the z scores are changed that's how the z scores are changed when we are basically working with the population working with the with the sampling distribution sorry let's move further Sometimes it happens that we do not obtain a pure normal distribution, rather we obtain 
in the proximate normal distribution. And this normally happens when the sample size is not very large or we do not have all the samples taken from the population. In this, in those cases, we although we do not get a perfect normal distribution, but what we get is basically an approximate normal distribution. And that approximate normal distribution is basically what we call as the T distribution. And we have when we have a T distribution, then this then the only thing that changes is the standard error of the mean value. And this becomes the sample standard deviation upon the square root of the total sample size. Because we normally get a T distribution in, in, in the cases that whether the sample size was not very large or the we do not get, we do not have all the samples from the population. And the, the third case could be that we do not have the population standard deviation. So therefore, in all these three cases, the SEM value only changes, which is S upon root N. The so capital N is the it is the sample size, total sample size. Please don't confuse this N and this N because over here in these cases, capital N was not the sample size, rather it was the total number of values in the distribution. So in these cases, this was not the sample size, rather it was the, sorry, it was the total number of values in these distributions. So this N was indicating total number of values comprising the random variable. Okay, so let's move further. The formula for T distribution is just like the Z distribution formula. And over here, the only thing that changes is the SEM. So T is X bar minus some population mean upon S upon root N. And it has a degree of freedom of capital N minus one because we are using the sample, sample where the standard deviation rather the population standard deviation. So this is a graph showing that how the Z and T are related. When the sample size increases, when it keeps on increasing the T the T distribution starts transforming into easy a Z distribution or a pure normal distribution. We use a Z table to solve for the normal distributions as we have been using earlier as well. And we use the T tables to solve for the T distribution problems. Like for example, this one over here, the T table. So this was a brief lecture about the central limit theorem. I hope and I, I assume that it was understandable to everybody. If still you have something lacking to understand, you can write in the comment section. In the next lecture, we will discuss about a simple example to rather more understand the concepts of this central limit theorem.